Hello, everybody. Welcome back to episode uh, number 49 of the Roses and Rhetoric podcast. If you're wondering why Joe is smiling, and I'll smile too, we're trying to get better with our thumbnails for our YouTube videos. We have a, a great habit of uh, finding terrific mud shots of one of the two hosts, and um, it's always a lot of fun. But uh, Joe, we're excited to, uh, to be seeing you again. Two weeks in a row is, uh, has been pretty good for us recently so uh, where are your yeah. travels today and uh, what are we going to be talking about today right so uh today i'm in spain i'm in malaga spain which is in the southeast side of the country um i as many of you know last episode we talked about uh, the incident that happened in poland um so i just want to give a quick follow-up on that yes you know we talked about some of the lessons we learned from it and whatnot um, so a few days ago, I was in Madrid, Madrid, Spain, which is the capital, and I was walking around in the town and some promoters for one of the clubs who approached me, some strangers came up to me and said, hey, uh, come into our club, like we'll give you some free drinks and, uh, you know, we'll give you, we'll cover your cover and you just come right in. And uh, you know what I said? Hell yeah. <laughs> Sign I, me. Said, I said, let's do it. I said, let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, no, I mean, I'll joke aside, I, I, that is what happened, but I did this time, thankfully, look at the reviews of the place, and it didn't have uh, 10 straight reviews of people claiming that they were drugged and scammed out of thousands of dollars. So that gave me some confidence to go in. Um, but still a little wary, still a little uh, he hesitant and cautious. Um, but... Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's good to have it miss have that near miss from before and just be a little safer now. I would say, but other than that, I mean, Spain people are definitely a lot. Um, I don't know if hospitable is the word, or they're just like a lot more colorful than the people in the Eastern Bloc. Definitely feels a lot less sketchy to go out. Like maybe there might be some more petty theft, but none of this like high organized crime like what we saw in the past. I think. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. Like, you just travel between countries here, and you fall asleep on an airplane. You wake up two hours later, and it's just a totally different, like, environment. Like, a totally different culture. Just, it, it's unreal. Like, in the States, you know, you go from state to state. It's not really that different. Like, I mean, the biggest difference is, like, California to Texas. But even so, like, the culture's not totally different, like, from Spain right. to, like, Poland or something. But... Yeah, that's a, it's been a big takeaway. Um, the beaches are also very different here. Um, no one wears clothes at beaches. <laughs> it's just, everyone is topless. Which is, I, I don't know, it's just very different, but no, no tan lines in Europe, I would say. <laughs> there is no tan lines in Europe. I think that that would be on their uh, their motto or something. They could be on their flag, just like, you know, no, like a no tan line person or something. Um, very interesting. Oh, yeah. Tell me, tell me this. I know that you took maybe a, a few semesters or so of Spanish in high school. Have you tried using any Spanish in Spain? Oh yeah. Well, thankfully, I I actually, I actually grew up in a Spanish-speaking household. Uh, right. I forgot. So I do have a little bit more Spanish than than most people. Um, sure. But yeah, it's totally. I use it every day because, like, a lot of people here just don't speak English. Um, I had to talk with a handyman today because our Airbnb, uh, we're the first ones to stay in it. And uh, it was a brand new remodeled unit and just like nothing works. Like we were doing dishes the other day and then all of a sudden there's just a flood in the kitchen. There's like a pool of water an inch deep because all the piping underneath the sink is just leaking. It's just spraying out. Like the overflow for the sink has like a nice little tube that is plumbed to. But that tube was just pointed in like in the middle of the cabinet. So uh, we had a big flood that we had to deal with. And then uh, I had to, they sent the handyman today to come fix it. And I had to talk to this handyman. And uh, that was pretty tough to do. Cause like, I don't know how to say like plumbing, like joints, like leaky, like any of those type of words. Right. So uh, it was a, a, big, a big charades game to explain to him what was going on. <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, I, I would be, pretty screwed if I didn't have any like Spanish background to be honest. True. Well, that's good to know. I, there is a, uh, I haven't ever read it, but I know there was uh, some work done 
back, I don't know, probably several decades ago, kind of an interesting thought experiment of like, how would we communicate with aliens if they were to come to Earth? And uh, we wouldn't have anything in common. We wouldn't have any words that we could use with them or anything like that. And so it's always like, what would you figure out? Obviously not the same scenario here. We are both human beings, but it's so interesting to, to think that mm. because you have two intelligent people on the other end, you can kind of work your way towards some kind of language you can make it with each other. A nice little, uh, a nice real life yeah. example of uh, conjecture and criticism and the universality of the human mind being brought into real life through language barriers. So. Yeah, yeah. Conjecture and criticism for the win again. For for the win yet again. Well, very good. Well, I uh, I am glad you're having better times in Spain. How long will you be in Spain for, and where are you going to next? Uh, I'll be in Spain uh, probably for like the next like few weeks. Um, I had some plans in early October that got canceled, so I'll probably uh, ride it out in Spain for the rest of my trip here. Uh, we're going to this I'm going to this island. It's called Tarif. Ter and it's like in the Canary Islands, which is like, I don't know, like an hour off the coast of Spain. I'm going there next. I think I leave on Tuesday or so. But, but uh, yeah, just get a little beach time in. It makes a lot of difference just having the sun in terms of like how you feel. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, you live in Houston, so you get lots of sun. But uh, right. it's getting a little cloudy over there on the eastern block, like, uh, <laughs> literally and uh, metaphorically. All right. <laughs> uh, very good. Very good. Well, we are keeping today's episode short. Uh, Joe is on cellular data right now. So uh, as we burn through the data, so are the sands through the uh, you know days of our lives, however the saying goes. Um, so let's move on to a couple of topics I was thinking of this week. Um, first, the Jewish study Bible. I will, uh, I will preface this conversation by saying one that I think Joe froze. So hopefully he'll come back to us soon. Um, he really is on cellular data. So we will, uh, might be hopping in and out as the episode progresses. Um, I'll give my, my little, my little spiel about what I wanted to talk about today, mostly on the, uh, story of, uh, Adam and Eve, but I will preface that by stating that, uh, in the desert Island book scenario game, uh, undoubtedly the book that I would pick would be the Jewish study Bible. Uh, really no book for me even comes close. I'm not Jewish. I'm not particularly religious. Um, but I would certainly pick the Jewish study Bible as my desert island book. Um, and not the least of which because the book is very long and it would give you plenty to read and to think about um, on the island. Joe, are you joining us again? Are you back on? I'm back. I, I paid some bills and uh, I got some more time. Uh, just very quickly, so you're caught up. I just uh, I explained that while I'm not Jewish, I the, the Jewish study Bible would be my desert island book, uh, in large part because it's a very long book and would give me plenty to read. Also, it's an important book and would give me important things to think about. Um, but I wanted to talk today about the Garden of Eden and how it relates to an open society. Um, in short, the uh, story of Adam and Eve. For those who aren't familiar, I'll do you know a quick paraphrasing of it? I'll, I'll imagine most of our audience has heard of the story before, but basically, uh, Adam is created. He's in the Garden of Eden. Um, aside from you know plenty of trees, etc., to eat from, the only tree that uh, he is not allowed to eat from him and Eve is the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And push comes to shove, the serpent you know tricks Eve into eating it. Then Eve gets Adam to eat it, and then God gets pissed, and everything goes to hell from there. Um, Basically, what I wanted to talk about today was understanding that story in a moral context and basically come to the defense of Adam and Eve, because since they lack the knowledge of good and evil, they had no ability to make moral choices anyways. They really couldn't have sinned when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil because they had no idea that what they were doing was in any sense wrong. Um, the, the, the prohibition against eating from the tree was that it was that they would die. So really their motivation was fear of death. And then the serpent convinces you that actually you won't die. And then she goes on to eat it. This is interesting because, again, I think it comes to somewhat of a defense of, uh, of Adam and Eve in this, in this story because they couldn't have been acting in an evil way. They didn't know what evil was. Um, 
and um, and also basically in some sense to to criticize their previous reluctance to eat the apple because it wasn't based on reason; it was based on a fear of death. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, I think that was basically it. I, I was rereading that story today and kind of been thinking about open societies, and I was thinking how the two relate to each other and to this mm -hmm. concept of moral choice um, as it befalls us. As human beings, we can discover and have conversations about morality through the same process that we obtain all knowledge and uh, that we should consider that to be something important that we do. Discovery of moral knowledge is just as important as discovering scientific knowledge. It happens the same way. It can capture criticism, open debate, open society, et cetera. Um, how do you, uh, how do you find a, a, the, first point. the objective? Ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, how do, you, how do you find an objective truth in something like morality? It seems like it would be more or less subjective from person to person, right? Well, I don't think so, because I think, like anything, when you have theories, those theories predict outcomes, and that you can use those outcomes to determine the validity of a theory or not. So, for example, if you if you state that people will be happy um, if you treat them like animals, I don't know that that's true. I don't know that that would borne out a historical example by virtue of the fact that people that are treated that way fight and rebel for the freedoms other people have. So, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would say that it's objective i think it's it's perhaps harder to verify and harder to reach than it would be say weighing you know how much does a does a you know a, a sphere of a certain color or something but i think that as long as you put the the criticism part in there and you look for prediction and you look for for certain outcomes that you can approach knowledge in that realm like you can knowledge in another realm kind of like art it's like again we, we we can use it's the same thing with art too it's harder to define objective truth with art but we can approach standards by looking at certain outcomes and seeing how those outcomes were predicted by different ideas in art. You know, the example in, 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 open, in the beginning of infinity is when you have a screw and a nut laying side by side, doesn't really look like anything much. And then you stack them in a certain way and all of a sudden the picture is more interesting. So there's something in there that so you can approach through knowledge to understand why, why is one picture more interesting than the other. So yeah. I think, in that, I think so, in a similar process, we can, object, we can approach moral uh ideas also so i understand like once you have a goal you can test different ideas like different moral ideas to see what gets you to that goal but mm -hmm. what is the goal of morality itself well i think the goal of morality is to understand what a person is and to treat persons well so to treat them well yes is, is, was the ultimate goal okay and then but then it gets a little subjective there, right? Because it's like, well, what is well? Maybe well for one person is different for one well, for would that, well, but then that would, but then you would be approaching at the objective is that people have differences and that we should respect those differences. That could itself be part sure. of the truth, that there's not one way to treat every single person. So that, mm -hmm. that could be the truth that you discover. When one person may like to eat apples, one like to eat strawberries. So what's the what's the moral to allow them to eat what they want to eat? You don't yeah, have as long as they're vaccinated, it doesn't matter. As long as they're vaccinated, as long as they're uh they can eat whatever they want. Exactly right. So but I, I think I, I think choice would be a would be a big part of um because and I'm actually gonna get to this in a little bit later on, but I think choice is important. And obviously a big part of an open society is having choice. And I think that it comes from the notion that within each person is a mind that is capable of approaching understanding of the world and that people should be able to use their minds to interact with the world. I'm going to come to that in a little bit when I talk about how to, I think, how to better think about capitalism with regard to this. But, um, but yes, but to, but to answer your first question, I think, I think choice would be a big part of a moral society because uh, people are different and in important ways, not just in trivial ways, you know, race or whatever it is, but in important ways that people understand things differently and that people have different goals in their own lives and that they should be allowed to explore those goals um, as they see fit. Um, just hypothetically, what if people, you, you had some way of accurately measuring happiness and what if you were able to determine that people that were controlled and that had less choice uh, lived objectively happier lives? Would that present a case for uh, that being the more moral outcome? just to, to tell people what to do? Well, I don't know, because if you do that, you would be in some sense destroying their personhood. 
So you would be destroying the thing that you were trying to improve upon. You, you'd be depriving a, an, an essential quality of, of a person, which is using a mind that they're in possession of. So if you control somebody, okay. then it's, you're turning them in, in some sense into an animal. So, so de depriving them of the mind would, would trump their overall happiness. Well, it, in other words, once you, once you take away their mind, it's what do you, you know, then since what is the person? I mean, it, it's, you be that, it's like if, if, you, if you take away the quality that makes you a person and then saying mm -hmm. doing so made you a happy person, I would say that that's a contradiction. You're no longer a person. You've taken away the thing okay. that made them a person in the first place. If, if you wanted okay. to put it in a wizard's context, you would just replace the word mind with the word soul. It would be the exact same conclusion. Mm -hmm. I see. And this this all comes from the uh, from the Jewish the Jewish Bible. <laughs> that was the first part. This the the uh, the the uh, second part I wanted to get to was um this um well let me let me, let me go to one one bullet and then because I think what we're talking about now will be a better part of a second bullet. I would I don't know if this really has any tie with the thing that we talked about on the show before, but I was thinking about it a lot this week. The uh, the notion that we live in a particular time and that we don't live in, in, in an abstract life, but we live in a particular life at a particular time in a particular place. And I was thinking of the, the consequences of that. And um, I think basically what it requires of us is that we have to, whatever we, have, whatever we hope to accomplish requires that we start with the current day imperfections of wherever we happen to be that I, I can't imagine how it could be another way. But we have to start wherever we are in that um, there is maybe a limitation because of that, but I think it's a reality nonetheless uh, that we have a certain, in some sense, practical limitations on what we can accomplish because of where we are in any particular time. And um, I, as I, I said, it just has a comment. I was thinking about that this week. Uh, yeah. you. Can you give like an example of that? So if you wanted to, what would be a good example? Um, I think politics is probably a good example that there are two dominant parties in politics. And if you want to have a strong political uh, career or political aspirations, it will probably require that you work with those two major parties, if not be a part right. of one. But there are certain limitations to um to trying to do work outside of pre-existing institutions, even though they're even though they're flawed, even though they're not perfect, um, the fact that they exist creates certain realities that they that they have to be, you know, in some sense, a part of the plan uh, in order to move things forward. So, how did that how did that happen in the past? Because there's been a whole range of an evolution of political parties. Like, there's been probably dozens of them in the U.S. alone that have just come to power and they're just gone away. Does that happen over the course of like one election period or is it like a gradual transition or what does that even look like? I, I have no idea. I, uh, I actually would like to get a, get a historian on the show uh, and have reached out to one, not about political history, but for another topic regarding history. But I think there was, um, there was something funny I listened to. Uh, it was from an Iranian lecture, not from her, but from one of her followers, I guess. But they were saying that uh, it was more important when you're young to study history rather than philosophy because history, philosophy is too abstract and that history gives you real concretes to attach ideas to. And um, yeah. when I was in high school, I did not really understand the importance of history. And as I have gotten older, I, I certainly am, am becoming more appreciative of it because um, Philosophy, many, I think in many ways, and in, in, at least in many times, it, it, it's too abstract. It's like, well, what are you actually doing with these ideas? It's hard to know. But history sure. is very much the battle of ideas. Uh, that's another idea that comes out with this. But that there's, you know, history is, is the competition of different ideas um, that human beings come up with and then put out into the world and you know, whatever impact they have, they have. But under understanding history in that context, I think makes it you know very important to study, especially in a country that, in some sense, you know, claims, and I think largely is founded on ideas, that history is the battle of ideas ought to be a great concern to us. It's something I've got to take very seriously when understanding um, the relationship between ideas and actions as they impact political events. So here's my problem with history. 
is that I don't think history is real. <laughs> and I mean that in the sense that, uh, well, first of all, it's always written by the victor, right? So that's one opportunity for history to get messed up. And it's like, look at our own civilization. Look at us today with all our cameras, with all of our media, with everything today. Like we still can't agree on what history is. Like half the country still believes that there was an insurrection on January 6th of this year. Well, the other half just believes that doesn't that didn't happen. Um, you know, there's two movies going on. And this is like with all our technology and all the eyes and dialogue and all that that comes with our 21st century living. Like what are the chances that anything like recorded from like the 1800s, like who won this battle? why Napoleon went to this country why this person did this like it just it just makes you start to look at that with like a real skeptical eye and even the Europeans will admit it they're like oh we don't really know what happened but this is kind of the standard the standard idea like this one historian wrote this like this one journalist yeah. wrote this from back in the day it's like how true can we treat that you know and also can we really learn from our history like I don't know it seems like uh like societies kind of have a, a tendency to just go towards a certain direction you know like people are kind of forgetting what brought us into the world war ii you know how someone like uh, hitler could take over like i think that we don't really understand how that happened we don't really have good preparations for avoiding that in the future i don't know maybe they would just get canceled early on and it wouldn't be an issue <laughs> But, well, yeah, I think I think history, you know, even in that regard, it would still be important for developing questions like you're doing now. I mean, all the questions yeah. you have are in some sense framed in a historical context. So that itself would be a benefit of history, that you understand a question you would want to know the answer to. Um, that people disagree on, on certain historical events is uh, certainly true. And I don't know that that is a, is a weakness for history in the sense that People disagree on scientific claims as well, and that you gradually get more to improve theory and understanding about those events. Yeah. History, like any field, will be imperfect and incomplete, but it can still glean knowledge the same way we glean knowledge from any other subject. That's you know, they're all in that boat. So that that doesn't so much concern me. I would say that um, understanding. Perhaps the most important decision to have about thinking about history is what actually drives history. And I would say that if I were to frame it, you have people who argue from kind of a materialistic perspective that, you know, this would be kind of the, the gun germs and steel argument of how history transpires. Then you would have maybe like David Boyd or Karl Popper who would argue that it's ideas that move history. And even if that, even if the reality is, you know, probably somewhere in the middle, understanding how to frame changes in society in those ways i think is useful as well in other words to imagine what would it mean for ideas to have an impact or what would it mean for the world to just be driven by material causes i think i think even just exploring those questions even though you may not arrive at the answer would still be a worthwhile exercise because what you can learn is that ideas can be powerful and that therefore ideas have consequences and that you could probably drive the same conclusion from material concerns as well that when people are deprived of material progress they will also engage in xy type behavior so i think i think even if you never arrive at specific answers of where a particular person was on a particular day i would say the bigger or maybe broader questions of history that are discussed are still worth all of us to consider because they involve you know these things that make us yeah. people namely ideas etc and how they interact with us and us with them like for, for example um do we know why the Civil War was fought? It seems like people, half the people say it was slavery, half the people say it was state rights. Like that's, that's a pretty important in terms of deciding whose statues we tear down today, right? Yeah, I don't know what the fraction of it would be about what, how many people believe one versus the other, or then even like the question of- I mean, do we know, is there any definitive- slavery itself so like state rights public rights for slavery or was it about secession was it about whatever um i would, I would say that i i have I would consider myself a believer in the 
Scott Adams' view of monuments, that they believe probably shouldn't be offensive or ornaments, basically, and no reason to have offensive ornaments uh, in, your, in your yard. But as far as, so that would be my point on the, on the statues. But I would say that even, even, those, uh, even those debates about why things happen, it still kind of brings up the idea of what drives history. And even in the case you're giving there, it would be an example of ideas. Whichever side it was, slavery versus state rights versus secession versus whatever versus the rights to one slave. I think, you know, the semantics, I don't know that they're all, all that important, but in any event, it would still be the driving of ideas that lead people to action. That would be a central point there. Sure, sure. But it's just like, I think you just got to be careful when making big ticket decisions based off history like that. Like, for example, like I, I said, like the statues, like it really determines whose statues get to go and whose get to stay is like how history was recorded that way. But I don't know, like you said, it's all ideas. Ideas can change and things, the ideas can move and that could, I don't know, maybe we'll be resurrecting some of these statues someday. Yeah, that I, that I very much doubt. I, I don't know. Um, but maybe some of the Abe Lincoln ones. <laughs> I don't know. I never understood why we were tearing down Abe Lincoln. Yeah, I didn't know that we were. I understand why we're tearing down a Confederate statue. I don't know why we were tearing down an Abe Lincoln statue. Um, oh, yeah. In any event, I would say um, if, it, if it really is ideas that drive history, you know, that, that I think is what it would be an important lesson to understand because it would, it would in, in, a, in a sense, it would change how we go about uh, political you know process would we just focus on people's material needs or would we go to a deeper level and trying to understand ideas that they're interacting with so i think i think that would have a consequence um and well other, other than that, i think that would be an important an important lesson to study and to understand okay See, what else did i have written down yes okay two more bullets i had so this one, desperate. So two two sayings or two cliches that I don't agree with. Desperation is the mother of all innovation. I think this is a uh, complete nonsense. I think uh, the Eastern Island example is the reason why it's complete nonsense. Uh, a lack of innovation may very well be the cause of desperation, but the source of innovation is an open society that values conjecture and criticism. A, a, a desperate, closed society. Uh, as Easter Island was, um, not embrace innovation. In fact, as we learned in that example, they embraced the opposite. They doubled down on their on their closeness, and the result was that they were uh, destroyed. Well, they got a little innovation, right? Like they had to come up with some some advanced engineering techniques to move those big heads around. Right, right. They they doubled down. Not productive their... innovation. Right, exactly. Not productive to their survival. Yes. Um, so that was that was one cliche that I don't agree with, and the second one that I don't agree with is that uh, greed is good. This is one that we hear all the time, especially in the United States. I don't agree with that saying, nor do I think greed is good for capitalism. Uh, greed is bad because it clouds reason. Really, reason is the one thing that we should use for making decisions. Um, Capitalism is good because it allows people to make choices which should only ever be based on reason. And those choices can't be different than other people who disagree, who reach their disagreement also based on a reasonable approach. Reasonable people can in fact disagree. Um, but that capitalism is good as an extension of self-determination. It has nothing to do with greed, which clouds judgment. Um, would, would you say that there's a difference between greed and uh, ambition? We yes. can define them differently. Yeah, I would say greed is the thoughtless pursuit of more. Ambition is realizing your potential and working to achieve it. The thoughtless pursuit of more. Greed. So that would be an example of, well, I don't know, like once, what, how would that be different than once someone has everything they need, they just like kind of stop and just go like hermit down somewhere. Why would that be great? That wouldn't be like, uh, like I guess, like let's look at like Bill Gates for example, right? Like he has all the money that he needs, like he can't even give it away fast enough. Um, 
but he's still going. He's still like, he, he still has like this. I, I don't want to call it a sense of greed because that is kind of a weird word for this, but he has like this, this greedy mentality of helping the world. Like he has this greed of wanting that feeling of helping people, of wanting that feeling of making a difference. And it's like, it, it, could that be considered a sense of greed in your book? No, because he's not doing it thoughtlessly. If you were to ask Bill, what are you trying to accomplish? You could explain reasons behind his motivations, the reasons for trying to improve malaria in Africa, reasons to try to improve the standings of women in you know whatever country they're involved in. I think that those would be, would be based on reason and not, not based on just a, a blind pursuit of capturing things. I think of greed as you know seeing somebody as something you want and just taking it from them with violence. To me, that would be an example of greed. It's just taking oh. something that you want. To me, that would be greed. Well, that, that's that's Wanting, not that's not the what capitalism is, though, right? No, oh, right. And that's, that's, where, that's why I don't think greed is good for capitalism. I think capitalism is good because of its okay. effort for self determination. That in fact, greed does not help capitalism. That was my whole point. It is not a part of it. Taking, it. taking from somebody is depriving that person of self determination and is and is depriving them of their own private property. That greed can result in that is why greed is bad for capitalism, and that is not it is really not needed to defend capitalism or to define it. So, would greed be synonymous with someone acting in their self-interest? Uh, I would say no, because if you act in unreasonable ways and bring about an unreasonable culture, it seems like you're going to pay for that. I think it may appear at, at a particular point in time to be in your self-interest, but that in the long run, it will be self-destructive. I think a lot of behaviors are that way. A lot of things seem to be in your self-interest, you know, becoming, uh, in, uh, overindulging in anything in a particular moment may feel good, but can in the long run lead to self-destruction. So I wouldn't call that acting in your self-interest either, although it may appear to be at the particular point in time when you're doing it. Are you there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. We lost you for a second. But you're back. You're back. Okay. Yeah, we're back. Very I had to pay some bills. I had to pay some bills. Very good. Well, those were all of my all of my bullets for today. Um, closing closing thoughts. Closing closing ideas. I know I know that we're bringing through data right now for your cellular network. Uh, but. Uh, so it sounds like you're having fun travels in Spain. I uh, it looks like a fun place. Yeah, Spain uh, might be my favorite so far, just in the short time I've been here. But no, I, yeah, good uh, good topics today. I think there's uh, some stuff to take home and think about for next week, and hopefully find some Wi-Fi by then. Find some Wi-Fi. Yes, please, please find some Wi-Fi. If anyone, if anyone is in, any of our viewers are in Spain and want to help Joe find some Wi-Fi, uh, be sure please. to find Joe by next weekend, and uh, we'll get him on the uh, on the show. Yeah. Um, very good. Well, Joe, any anything else before we close out for today's episode? Oh, that's it. All right. Well, everybody, we appreciate you joining us. Episode number forty-nine of the Rose Rider Podcast. Uh, Again, another short one, uh, but nonetheless, uh, a fun conversation as always. Be sure to follow us online uh, on Twitter at roses underscore rhetoric, also on Instagram at roses underscore rhetoric. Be sure to follow Joe as well at Jose for underscores on Twitter and Instagram. And also our website, www.rosesandrhetoric.com. And find us on YouTube, search roses and rhetoric. Until next time, I'm Jimmy Hackett signing off for Joseph Stanford saying adios.